Good evening, dear friends, and a very warm welcome to this evening's episode on Who's Who in the Bible. This evening, I will be reflecting with you on John the Baptist. But before we begin, let's invoke the Holy Spirit to animate the session, to allow the words of God to penetrate into our hearts this evening. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, all things are created, and it shall renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit, open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to listen to your word. Touch and transform our lives and make us your very own. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. Apart from Jesus Christ, John the Baptist is probably the most theologically significant and well-known figures in the Gospels. While John was known as the Baptist, he was in fact the first prophet called by God since Malachi, some 400 years earlier. John's coming was foretold over 700 years previously by, by another prophet. I'd like to read this text from the book of prophet Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 to 5. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This passage illustrates God's master plan in action, as God selected John to be his special ambassador to proclaim his own coming. John was indeed a lone voice in the wilderness as he proclaimed the coming of the Messiah to a people who desperately needed a savior. John's birth was miraculous. He was born of elderly parents who had never been uh, able to have children. We read about this birth narrative in Luke chapter one, verse seven. The angel Gabriel announced to Zechariah, a Levitical priest, that he would have a son. News that Zechariah received with disbelief. Gabriel said this about John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We read about it in Luke chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. True to the word of the Lord, Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, gave birth to John. At the circumcision ceremony, Zechariah said this about his son, You, my child will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. John was related to Jesus as their mothers were relatives. So we hear about it in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. In fact, when the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would give birth to Jesus, he also told her about John. When Mary was carrying Jesus in her womb, she visited Elizabeth, her cousin, and John leapt in his mother's womb for joy 
at the sound of Mary's voice. We hear about it in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45. We also see here that John's birth not only parallels that of Jesus, but echoes the momentous occasion of the birth of Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. We read about it in the book of Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 to 22, and chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. John is clearly a pivotal figure in the salvation history of God. As an adult, John lived a rugged, ascetic life in the mountainous area of Judea, between the city of Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. He wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, the typical garb of a prophet. His diet was a simple one, locusts and wild honey. We read about it in Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. John lived a simple life as he focused on the kingdom work set before him. Although his uh, formative years were lived in obscurity in the desert, his public ministry ended nearly 400 years of prophetic silence. John's message and ministry marked not only the culmination of the law and the prophets, but also proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God. We read about it in Matthew eleven twelve 12, and Luke 16, 16. The central theme of his ministry was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So John was truly a transitional figure, forming the link between the Old and the New Testaments. He spans the ages with one foot firmly planted in the Old Testament and the other squarely placed in the New. John the Baptist's ministry grew in popularity. As recounted in Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. To be baptized by John was to admit your sin and repent of it, which was, of course, a great way to be prepared for the Savior's coming. The repentance associated with John's baptism also kept the self-righteous out of the water, as they did not see themselves as sinners. For the self-righteous, John had stern words, calling them a brood of vipers, and warning them not to rely on their Jewish lineage for salvation, but to repent and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We read about it in Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. John's faith made him fearless in the face of opposition. John was an end time prophet. He conducted his ministry with an eschatological authority that demanded immediate action. He taught that judgment is at hand. The axe is laid at the roots and God will thoroughly purge his threshing floor. We read in Matthew chapter 3 verses 10 to 12, Luke 3, 9 and Luke 3, 17. And the authenticity of repentance for John was manifested in very practical terms. Share with those in need. Eliminate graft or corruption and prohibit extortion. Luke 3, 11 to 14. 
The general opinion of John the Baptist was that he was a prophet of God. Matthew 14, 5. And many people may have thought that he was the Messiah. This was not his intent, as he had a clear vision for what he was called to do. In John 3.28, John says, You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. John cautioned his disciples that what they had seen and heard from him was just the beginning of the miracle that was to come in the form of Jesus. John was merely a messenger sent by God to proclaim the truth. His message was simple and direct. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 3, 2. He knew that once Jesus appeared on the scene, John's work would be all but finished. He willingly gave up the spotlight to Jesus, saying, He must become greater. I must become less. John 3.30 Perhaps there is no greater example of humility than what is seen in both Jesus and John in Matthew 3 verses 13 to 15. Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John in the river Jordan. John rightly recognized that the sinless Son of God needed no baptism of repentance and that he was certainly not worthy to baptize his own Savior. But Jesus answered John's concern by requesting baptism to fulfill all righteousness meaning that he was identifying himself with sinners for whom he would ultimately sacrifice himself, thereby securing all righteousness for them. And St. Paul will talk about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. In humility, John obeyed and consented to baptize Jesus. As Jesus came up out of the water, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We read about it in verses 16 to 17. John even allowed his disciples to leave his own leadership and follow after Jesus. Again, in John chapter 1, 35 to 39, we hear about this. John was a fiery prophet, proclaiming the apocalyptic message of God. Indeed, Luke says that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke 1, 17. He goes on to allude to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, which states that Elijah will return before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. In fact, some contemporaries of John inquired if he were Elijah. We hear about it in John chapter 1, verse 21. The belief that Elijah would return and prepare the way of the Lord can be traced to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 and chapter 4, verse 5. Such belief is also found in the extra biblical accounts of Sirah chapter 48, verse 10 and 2 Esdras chapter 6, verse 2 and following. The Gospels also indicate that many believed that Elijah would come first and then the Christ. We have lots of references in the gospel, starting with Matthew 11, verse 14, 17, verse 10, in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 15, 
9 verse 11 and Luke chapter 9 verse 8. John flatly denied that he was Elijah reincarnated. In John 1 21 and John 1 25 we hear about this. Nevertheless, Jesus affirmed that Elijah must come first and that he had come in the person of John the Baptist. We hear about it in Matthew chapter 17 verses 11 to 13 and Mark 9 verses 12 to 13. John fulfilled Malachi's prophecy in a spiritual sense rather than in a literal way. John was no crowd pleaser. He willingly confronted the hypocrisy of the religious establishment. We, re we read about it in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, Luke chapter 3 verse 7. He did not hesitate to expose the immorality of Herod. Herod had married the former wife of his brother Philip. John boldly spoke out against this marriage, much to the dislike of Herodias, Herod's new wife. We read about it in Luke chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, Mark 6, verses 17 to 20. As a result, John was imprisoned. While John was in prison, he heard of all the things Jesus was doing. In what seems to be a moment of doubt, John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask if he truly was the Messiah. Jesus responded by telling the men to tell John what they saw and heard. Prophecies were being fulfilled. Jesus never rebuked John. Rather, he gave evidence that he was the promised Savior. We read about this account in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 6, Luke 7, verses 18 to 23. Jesus then spoke to the crowd about John, saying he was the prophesied mess messenger who would come before the Messiah. Matthew 11, 10, Luke 7, verse 27, and Malachi 3, verse 1. Jesus also said, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Matthew eleven eleven, Luke 7, verse 28. In this way, Jesus acknowledges the central role that John played in God's plan of salvation. He was the greatest born of women among women because he had the privilege of pointing to the Lamb of God. John 1 verses 29 to 34. Yet, as the last great prophet of the pre-Christian era, he was the least in the kingdom of God. Matthew 11, 11, Luke 7, 28. John the Baptist's ministry, as well as his life, came to an abrupt end at the hand of King Herod. He chose to die a martyr's death rather than compromise his convictions. We read about this account in Matthew chapter 14, verses 3 to 12 and Mark 6, 17 to 29. In an act of unspeakable vengeance, Herodias plotted with her daughter to have John killed. Herodias' daughter danced for Herod and his dinner guests one night. And Herod was so pleased that he said to her, Ask me for anything you want and I will give it to you. Mark 6:22. The girl consulted with her mother before she answered that she wanted the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Verse 25. Herod had been afraid of John, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. Verse 20. 
and so was loath to kill the prophet. But he had promised to give the dancing girl whatever she asked. Since John was already in prison, it was a simple thing to send the executioner to behead John, which is exactly what happened in Mark 6, verses 27 to 28. It was a sad and ignoble end to the life of such a faithful man. Even though John was merely a witness serving as a transitional figure, the impact of his life and ministry should not be underestimated. During his lifetime, he had a following of disciples who shared common practices such as fasting and prayers. We read about the disciples of John in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, John 1, verses 35 to 37, and chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. John's disciples survived his death and spread throughout the Mediterranean world. Apollos was from Alexandria in North Africa, and at one point knew only of the baptism of John. We hear about it in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 25. Similarly, upon arriving at, uh, in Ephesus, Paul encountered about a dozen disciples of John. They too had only experienced the baptism of John. We read about it in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. These instances indicate that the Baptist movement may have had more influence than what we are able to glean from the New Testament. From our study of John the Baptist, we can see how his life served as a paradigm for interpreting the life and ministry of Jesus. For example, the inclusion of the suffering and death of John may foreshadow the pain and death of Jesus on the cross. The ill treatment of John by Herod Antipas may have had a significant impact upon Jesus' early ministry in Galilee and in his final days in Jerusalem. Even the topographical setting of John's ministry may be of theological significance. The desert setting may underscore the stark nature of John's message or may be symbolic of Israel's struggle in the desert. There are several lessons we can learn from the life of John the Baptist. One lesson is that wholehearted, wholeheartedly believing in Jesus Christ is possible. John knew that the Messiah was coming. He believed this with his whole heart and spent his days preparing the way for the Lord's coming. But the road was not an easy one to prepare. Daily, he faced doubters who did not share his enthusiasm for the coming Messiah. Under hard questioning from the Pharisees, John shared his belief, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals am not worthy to untie. John chapter 1 verses 26 to 27. John believed in the Christ and his great faith kept him steadfast on his course until the time when he could say as he saw Jesus approach, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 As believers, we can all have this steadfast faith. While in prison, John's faith in Christ was put to test. But John sent a messenger out to Jesus in an effort to find the truth. As Christians, we all will have our faith put to the test. And we will either falter in our faith or like John, cling to Christ, seek truth 
and stand firm in our faith to the end. John's life is an example to us of the seriousness with which we are to approach the Christian life and our call to ministry, whatever that may be. John lived his life to introduce others to Jesus Christ. He was focused on the mission God had given him. John also knew the importance of repenting of one's sins in order to live a holy and righteous life. And as a servant of God, he also was unafraid of speaking truth, even when it meant calling out people such as Herod and the Pharisees for their sinful behavior. And this is what we call speaking truth to power. We too, like John, are called upon to share the truth of Jesus with others and to be courageous and fearless. We can follow John's example of faithful and obedient trust in God as we live and proclaim His truth in whatever life circumstances God has given us. In conclusion, dear friends, John the Baptist is of great theological importance in the New Testament. He, he ended nearly 400 years of prophetic silence and paved the way for the Messiah. In the spirit of Elijah, he preached a message of repentance and baptism. In his darkest hour, he questioned if Jesus was the one who was to come or whether there would be another. He inaugurated a spiritual movement that had influenced long after his death and extended throughout the Mediterranean world. As we draw this episode to conclusion, let us pray. Teach us, dear Lord, like John, to prepare the way for you in the lives of others. Not to get bogged down in building our own kingdom or making sure that we be the center of attention. As John sums it up well when he says, he must become greater, I must become less. Let this be our heart's cry to Amen. The Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, and God bless you.